<clears throat> hey, praise the Lord. <laughs> I was out mowing the grass and uh, several things have just going through my head. And this is kind of a rant, you know, this is one of these things where uh, I just want to say something or do something, but uh, uh, I have all of Charles Finney's books and I've read them multiple times and I understand that he never did really see the problem with Paul but he also didn't teach and he stood against Calvinism and dealt with a lot of the issues and the moral government and uh, moral government meaning Father Yahweh designed man and man is to follow the instructions or the guidelines in which the Father created us and how we should live to the proper way that we're designed to and so here's some stuff that uh, that I have on file that I just really influenced me or helped me and some of this I knew all this before I had kids so I raised my kids as free moral agents they had the ability to choose right or wrong they're not caused a certain way they were taught that they're not born sinners they don't have a fallen nature and all this other stuff they're born innocent and so regardless of what Paul says, our Heavenly Father also backs up what he says. Now listen to Charles Finney here. <clears throat> if there is a decay in conscience, the pulpit is responsible for it. If the public press lacks moral discernment, the pulpit is responsible. If the church is de degenerated, degenerated, degenerate, and worldly, the pulpit is responsible. If the world loses interest in Christianity, the pulpit is responsible. If Satan rules in our halls of legislation, the pulpit is responsible for it. If our politicians become so corrupt that their very foundations of our government are ready to fall away, the pulpit is responsible. Charles Grenerson Finney. And I see that. I see that I, as I'm coming in the last three, two to three years, coming and really seeing the importance of God's laws and those laws that apply to us and the failure of the church, the church welcoming and helping anybody and everybody. Our Heavenly Father took out thousands and thousands of people. They talk about, oh, God loves sinners. He lists multiple places where he hates people who do these things. It makes him disgusted. Yeshua, the Lord Jesus, had many people walk away from him. He said hard things. He didn't bait them. Nobody to this date has showed me in the New Testament where Jesus says, the gospel is go and tell people that God loves him. He never ever says that. He goes repent and believe for the remission of sins. Get right with our Heavenly Father. John 3, 16, they always misquote it. They take it out of context. Just as, uh, as it says, for, for as in the like manner he was lifted up, God showed his love. He gave them the Lord, the cross to look for, our, our uh, <laughs> I lost my train of thought, our mediator, uh, our, our uh, Messiah, someone to show us the way. He had to get the Jews straightened out in order to have them help us sojourners and the Gentiles and the different people who come to teach them. That's the whole point of the Jews is set inside a group of people who can teach the entire world what our Heavenly Father says, does, and wants us to do. Moral depravity. This is Charles Finney. I had this, they had this hanging up at my church for a long time, believe it or not. Why is sin so natural to mankind? Why is sin so natural to mankind? I used to struggle for years when I first became a Christian with pornography and moral stuff that guys struggle with and I kept blaming God because Christ in me the hope of glory isn't strong enough up until the last four years or five years did the father say hey it's your moral choice 
you choose this day whom you will serve. Will you serve sin or you serve me? He said, I cannot share and teach his, his words while living in sin. How many pastors live in sin? Why is sin so natural to mankind? Not because their nature is itself sinful. Think about this. But because the appetites and the passions tend so strongly to self-indulgence. I've watched drinkers. I've watched drug addicts. That is one of my strongest points. Now, since I confessed it, I'll probably get tested on the thing. But the, I have very, very strong areas of my life where other people can't even go near a bar or even smell alcohol without them being tempted because they've weakened what was strong inside them in the first place. These are the temptations of sin, but sin itself consists not in these and propensities, propensities, but in the voluntary committal of the will to their indulgence. If we voluntarily will, we choose to indulge ourselves in those areas that we know our desires are and build those up, then the desires take over. This is the committal of the will is selfishness. And when the will is once given up to given up, given up to sin, it is the very nature or it's very natural to sin. The will once committed to self-indulgence, as it ends, selfish actions are in a sense spontaneous. I'm gonna read that over. Now, if you look this up, if you do a search on this, Charles Grandison Finney, Moral Depravity, you'll probably get this. Why is sin so natural to mankind? Not because their nature is itself sinful, but because the appetites and the passions tend so strongly to self-indulgence. These are the temptations of sin, but sin itself consists not in these and propensitous propensities, but in the voluntary committal of the will to their indulgence. This is the committal of the will is selfishness. And when the will is once given up to sin, it is very natural to sin. The will once committed to self-indulgence as it ends, selfish actions are in sense spontaneous. Wow, that is a mouthful right there. My kids could never say that their brother caused them to sin. They made me sin. No, sin is a moral choice. You choose to respond or react a certain way. If you haven't built it up, then you can't defend yourself. See? Page 189 of Autobiography of Charles Finney, The Will. The point that I pressed upon the people was the distinction between desire and will. So that they might know whether they were really Christians or not. Whether they were really consecrated persons or whether they were merely had, or merely had desires without being in fact really willing to obey Yahweh. When this distinction was made clear, the Holy Spirit fell upon the congregation in a most remarkable manner. A large number of persons dropped their heads and some groaned so that they could be heard throughout the house. It cut up the false hopes of deceived, of deceived professing Christians on every side. Several rose on the spot and said that they had been deceived and that they could see where light. This was carried to such an extent as greatly astonished me. Indeed, it produced a general feeling of astonishment in the congregation. The work went on with power. Professing Christians obtained new hope 
or being genuinely converted in such numbers that a very great and important change came over the whole community. In a few days after this, one of our theological students, Rosa, asked whether the gospel provided for Christians all the conditions of an established faith and hope and love, whether there was something better or higher than Christians had generally experienced. In short, whether sanctification was obtainable in this life. That is sanctification in such a sense that Christians could have unbroken peace and not come into condemnation or have feeling of condemnation or a consciousness of sin. The answer is yes. It was a question of being practical. The goal of applying to every area of our lives is doable. To reject it is to reject the teachings of Yeshua. It is a question of being practical. The goal of applying every area of our lives is doable. To reject it is to reject the teachings of Yeshua. A lot of people hated video. I, oh man, it's just an incredible amount of people that are against what he's saying. But Yeshua told the woman who was caught in adultery and they didn't have the man there. So he couldn't apply the law because you're supposed to stone both of them. He said, go and sin no more. He wasn't joking when he said that. He said, go and sin no more. He told the man who he told to pick up his, his uh, mat on the Sabbath, who got healed and said, go. And when he seen him later, he said, do not sin for something worse may happen to you. The guy was there for, I forget, a lot of years. That would put fear in you to even think of sinning and being trapped on that mat again. He didn't say he was on that mat because of sin. He used that illustration of the horrible life that that guy had led is what it's like to sin. See, Yeshua dealt with sin. When Peter and them guys walked into and they found a man born blind and he spit in the mud and put eyes in him. Eye sockets. They didn't even recognize him. We're not talking a blind man with eyeballs. We're talking hollow sockets and the whole guy didn't even look the same. So when he got it, even it, they, they had to call his parents. He said, no. He, sickness wasn't there because of sin. That's why by his stripes we are healed. It's moral healing. Father has always made a way to heal people. He's had pawns. He's had healings. He had priests do different things. Healings were all around because of the fall of, of mankind. We're morally healed. That is more important than physically healed. Father, I am so grateful for you. Uh, wow, I'd love to live during the finished life. I just cannot grasp what it's like. He walked in, and I'm not glorifying Finney. You, Father, worked in him. You, Father, your spirit was so present with him that he could walk into a factory and people would start crying because their sin and guilt was upon them. And they would shut the factory down for two days until everybody got their lives right with God. And they moved on and they affected towns and cities and bar rooms were closed or changed. Father, the pulpit has let our society get towards that today because of all the soft spoken easy acceptance of grace false teaching every church is following Paul to one extent or another please father forgive us please father raise up people who will follow the truth and obey your Torah your laws in Yeshua's precious name Amen.